Hi, Mike Gaben here with a KSP tutorial. Today we're getting into orbit, and I'm going to start off with doing the Go for Orbit training mission that's built right into the game. Now, whoa, 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 don't go anywhere. I know what you're thinking. What's the point of a tutorial that's just watching someone do one of the stock tutorials? Well, I'll, it'll be a bit more than that. I'll be talking about a few things as I do the tutorial, and then we'll just see if we can not get that rocket up a bit more efficiently than what we do in the training mission. So this is the Kerbal 1. And Gene here in the window, he's going to help us, well, and Valentino too, of course, get this thing into orbit. And what he's going to give us here is this target. You can see there on the nav balls a purple target that's giving us something to follow. And this is going to guide us through doing a proper gravity turn. All we have to do is follow the purple icon. There it goes, it's starting to tilt over now. Now, this gives us an opportunity to actually talk a little bit about the nav ball. Understanding the nav ball is really important if you're going to be doing uh, pretty much anything, I think, in Kerbal Space Program. So the nav ball, well, is a ball, it's a sphere. And right now that sphere is completely blue. Blue represents up, blue for the sky. And so, uh, if you want to go up, you're going to be pointing your rocket into the blue section, and your rocket is represented by that sort of bird-like orange structure, the little V with the wings coming off the side. That's meant to be your rocket or your plane. Now, as we tilt over or change our pitch, you can start to see some of the orange appearing, and the orange represents down. Now let's start talking about some of the numbers that are on that nav ball. Uh, first thing I want to draw attention to is pitch. Right now we're at a pitch of about 60 degrees. And um, that means 60 degree, oh, there goes our boosters. All right, gotta love explosions. <laughs> Anyways, I was saying, we're at a pitch of about, well actually now we're at a pitch of about 50 degrees. Uh, pit, that's 50 degrees above the horizon. The horizon is zero and 90 degrees is straight up and what people should be taking note of if they want to start doing this without doing the tutorial is our altitude our altitude now is about 14 kilometers we're at a pitch of about 45 degrees so sort of take note of at what pitch you want to be at certain altitudes and the basic gist of it is is that we're slowly pitching over the other thing I want to draw attention to is our heading we are heading at about 90 degrees. It's on the nav ball and it's also on a, a display down there at the bottom of the nav ball. Actually, it says 91 degrees, but that's close enough. 90 degrees is east, uh, 0 degrees is north, 90 degrees is east, 180 south, 270 is west, and you can figure out it goes in between all of those. Uh, I'll be talking why east. Pretty much all the time you want to get yourself into orbit, you want to be heading in an eastward direction. We'll talk about why. Well, on the second go of this, I think we'll talk about why. Okay, there goes our main booster. Now it's all up to this little orbiter. Let's get over to uh, Matthew and sort of see what our situation is. There we are. Zoom in. You know, I'm going to put this on prograde so I don't have to worry about steering right now. And we're at about 40 kilometers. We want to get that apoapsis up to 80 kilometers and at 80 kilometers we're going to turn off our engine uh, and actually I don't need to be in the map view here if you look at Gene's display you can see he's very kindly providing me with my uh, current altitude and my apoapsis so again I want to get to my apoapsis which is the highest point in my trajectory uh, I want to get that up to 80 degrees at which point I'm going to be turning off my engine. You can see now we're down to a pitch of about 15 degrees with an altitude of 40 kilometers. So now we are going pretty close to being horizontal. And that's really what this is all about. We need to build up speed. Specifically, to stay into orbit, we need a speed of in around two and a quarter kilometers per second. Right now we're at about a kilometer and a half per second. So we need more speed. If we can get that speed, then we will continue falling. We talked about this in the last episode, but the arc of our trajectory will continue to miss the ground, really. It will match the curvature of Kerbin, and we'll never get down to the ground. It will remain in orbit. Now, to be quite honest, this gets pretty boring, and Gene doesn't let me do any time warping. 
but that doesn't stop me from uh, let's doing a little time warping on my own on the video playback. There we go, main engine cutoff because our apoapsis is at 80 kilometers. And now it's just riding it up to our highest point where we will perform one last burn to complete our circularization. And you know, I mentioned the prograde vector uh, without really explaining it. The, the prograde vector is the direction that you are currently moving and it is represented by the yellow circle on the nav ball. There are a number of other vectors that we'll talk about as we continue to explore these tutorials, but right now it's all about prograde. If you noticed all the way up, we never veered that far from the prograde vector. All right, Gene has just set up a maneuver node for us and I'm gonna talk about maneuver nodes in the second go around. But all we have to do at this point is wait for the appropriate time to perform that burn. And you can see there, there is an estimated time for the burn. It is eight seconds. And there's also a time to the burn, which has just gone underneath a minute. Uh, when I get down to the point where I'm getting close to the estimated length of the burn, I'm gonna to start to burn. And actually, Gene's gonna tell me when to do it as well. The other thing you notice is Gene is actually telling me to put it on the direction of the maneuver node. That's that little blue icon on the nav ball. That's the direction he actually wants me to burn in. I automatically, out of habit, put it on the prograde vector because I'm actually used to doing this without using maneuver node at all. And with a little bit of practice, you'll do this too without using the maneuver node. Now what this burn is going to do for us is give us our last bit of kick of velocity. Right now we are still suborbital. We're still going to crash in the ground because we're not going fast enough. According to the maneuver, we need to add on another 150 meters per second of velocity to get us up to around our two and a quarter meters per second velocity that we need in order to miss the ground. So here we go. And you can see our orbit coming up. And we are in orbit right now, but because I am a fastidious son of a bee, there we go. I like to get it pretty close to circular where my periapsis, which is the lowest point of my orbit, is pretty close to my apoapsis. And there we go, we are now in orbit. And what I wanna draw attention to in the amount of fuel I have left, I have 51.07 units of fuel. What I wanna do is get back into the vehicle assembly building and see if we can not get up and have a little bit more fuel left over. So now I'm in game, a regular sandbox game. And what I wanna do is load up the Kerbal One which is one of these pre-made ones for us. There it is, so we'll load that up. Now, to be honest, I, I actually rather do like this little rocket. Um, I like its uh, simplicity. You know, it's, it's made out of fairly simple parts, parts early on the tech tree, and it is the kind of thing that you would build, you know, in a career mode, I think. It's very typical of that. But uh, there's some things I don't like about it. One was, well, last episode we talked about thrust to weight ratios, and I found this thing, well, it just, didn't really have enough oomph for me in the upper part of its trajectory. So we're gonna see what we can do to maybe build up our speed a little bit more quickly. I'm gonna start from the top stage and work my way down. So we'll take off the booster here so we just have the orbiter. And according to our engineering stats down there at the bottom, this thing has a mass of 5.1 tons and it's powered by this LV909 engine, which has a max thrust of 60 kilonewtons. This gives us a thrust to weight ratio of about 1.2, which isn't bad, to be honest. In fact, if it were just maneuvering in orbit, it would be absolutely fine, but it is responsible for a good portion of our ascent, so I would love to have had a higher thrust to weight ratio. Unfortunately, uh, the thrust limiter on that engine is already at 100%, so there's nothing I can do with it. So what we'll do is we'll put the booster back on, we'll take off the SRBs, and what I'm interested in, in now is what is the thrust to weight ratio right when these tanks run dry. So I'm gonna take out all of this fuel, and see what the mass is uh, right at the point where I uh, end up ejecting this stage. All right, there we go, fuel empty. That gives me a mass of 7.5 tons. And with the thrust limiter at its current 65%, that is a thrust to weight ratio of only 1.77. Now, 
that I, I do not like that at all. By that point, I am in the upper part of the atmosphere. I want to be building up speed. I want to be accelerating at a much higher rate than that. So I'm going to put the thrust limiter up to 100. That gives me a thrust to weight ratio of 2.72 much better though hardly ideal i would actually still like it to be more in the 4 4.5 range to be honest i mean we need to be building up speed at that point but i don't want to change the design of this i think that'll be cheating uh this is not really how i would put this thing together i think it has too much the orbiter's too big and the booster's too small in my humble opinion uh but that is what it is basically what i did is i worked through the whole rest of this working out thrust to weight ratios and tweaking them now in the last episode i talked a lot about calculating thrust to weight ratio if you want a reminder on how to do that just go back to f1 there's a link to it if you click on the uh, information cards dewey up there at the top but uh this is the information that i got so here are my before stats these are the numbers before I started doing any tweaking with the rocket. On the orbiter, which I'm calling stage three, the thrust to weight ratio at the start was 1.20 with it completely fueled, and it went up to 2.35 by the time it would be empty. Stage two, which is the liquid fuel booster, initial thrust to weight ratio of 1.32, which climbed to 1.77 by the time it was empty and ready to be staged. And finally, uh, launch thrust to weight ratio was 1.67, which climbed to 3.06 by the time the SRBs were separated, which to me, you're still pretty low in the atmosphere. I think that's too fast. So, did a bit of tweaking. Here are my new thrust to weight ratio. Orbiter, exactly the same. I couldn't change anything with that. Remember, the engine was already at 100%. Stage two now starts off at 1.64 and climbs to 2.72. Stage three, I actually reduced the thrust. So the thrust to weight ratio at launch is only 1.45, more in the range, and then it climbs to 2.19 at the point where the SRBs get separated. You like where that separation to occur for those two thrust to weight ratios, the 2.19 to the 1.64, those two, that's the transition. You would like that transition to be maybe a little bit more smoother, but to be honest, that's, it's not too bad and certainly much better than it was. That leaves me one last thing that I want to tweak with this particular rocket. I personally found it just a little bit too twitchy. I find that quite often with the stock uh, attitude controls that they're just a little bit too twitchy. So we're gonna dial them down a little bit. This rocket actually has four separate systems for controlling attitude. Uh, two of them I'm not gonna touch. The reaction wheels up in the capsule and the RCS system, which is a tutorial in of itself. But I do wanna adjust the gimbling um, these rockets here swivel, that's why this one's actually called a swivel, but I find they swivel too much. So I'm going to turn the gimbling down to about 50%, and same thing with the LV, the orbital engine up here, uh, I'm going to turn that one down to about 50%. And the other thing I want to adjust is the authority limiter on these tail fins. I find these are always way too twitchy, so I want to dial them down, I'm going to, they're at 100, I'm going to put them at... 50 as well. Let's find the right spot here. There we go, that's good enough. All right, now it's time to get this show on the road and see how we did. And in the interest of brevity, we're running this at four times speed. Those SRBs right now are their own stage. I don't have the uh, swivel liquid fuel engine going. It doesn't go on until the boosters are gone. And of course, I'm following much the same trajectory as before. Actually, to be honest, I'm going a little, I like my, I like it a little bit shallower. That's just me. But the main thing is, is it's not, you know, don't get too nitpicky with it. What's more important is just staying on that prograde vector. That's sort of more the main thing. And to slowly get yourself over, you know, I'm getting a little bit of heating, but that's no big deal. I don't need to worry about that. Get yourself into the higher part of the atmosphere, get yourself moving more or less horizontally and start building up that speed. Cutting off at 80 kilometers. 
There we go. Okay, now one of the things I talked about very briefly on my first ascent and kind of then just shuffled off is why do you launch east? Well, remember, you want to get yourself up to an orbital velocity of about two and a quarter kilometers per second. But Kerbin, of course, is rotating towards the east, and the speed at which it's rotating is 175 meters per second. So you already have some speed towards the east. So going towards the east, or what we call in a prograde direction, is the more efficient way to go because you're taking advantage of that velocity that you already have thanks to Kerbin's rotation. Anyway, we need to get just fiddling around with this maneuver node. Want to get it right on the prograde. Oh, I think I just added a bit a normal vector. Oh dear, let's see if I can take that off. Uh, okay, well, you know what, forget it. I'm actually getting pretty close to Time to do it. Okay, periaps is still a little bit low, a little bit more prograde. I'm actually more used to doing this without using a maneuver node at all, so that's why I'm fumbling a little bit, but that's okay. Ah, the heck with it, let's go. We're too close, okay. So we're just again burning prograde, getting ourselves up to orbital velocity. You can see I have a little bit more to do at the top end here because uh, my thrust lower down was lower before. Now my thrust up, now that I, ha I came up with a higher thrust, I came up much more quickly than I did before. So I need to add more of velocity out here in space, but that's okay. The key is what it does it all add up to. Okay, that camera change is telling us that we are close. Let's take a look-see here. Let's get rid of the maneuver node now. Well, periapsis is still a little low. Let's burn a bit more. Oh, that's uh, a little uglier than I'm used to, but we'll go with it. Not the prettiest thing in the world. The important thing is fuel. Oh, 64 units of fuel? If you recall last time, I was up here with 51.07 units of fuel. So that's 25% more fuel in our orbiter. So just with a little bit of tweaking on that rocket, not changing a single part, not changing the amount of fuel that was in the part, we are now up here with quite a bit more fuel. And of course we are now in orbit. Valentina can stay up here as long as she likes. She can go round and round and round until we're bored of her going round and round and round. Ooh, let's pop out a map view and watch the sunrise. Sunrise at 50 times speed, there we go. In fact, let's let's kill the time warp. Let's get this uh, ma uh, the nav ball out of the way. We don't need that. Let's kill the time warp. And I think Valentina needs to stretch her legs. And while we're out here enjoying the view, you know, that's quite a bit of extra fuel. Maybe there's something we can do with that. It would seem a shame just to waste it. I think I'm going to have to make that the next tutorial. In Kerbal Space Program, there is a definite boundary between Kerbin's atmosphere and space at 70 kilometers above sea level. Vessels that have all parts of their orbit above this line are in a perfect vacuum and will stay in space indefinitely in perfectly stable orbits. But in the real world, it's not quite so simple. For Earth, the traditional boundary between the atmosphere and space is at 100 kilometers. It's called the Karman Line, named after the Hungarian engineer and physicist Theodor von Karman, who calculated that above this altitude, the atmosphere was too thin to support aeronautical flight. However, it's not like the atmosphere ends here. Far from it. Particles of gas, which, after all, is what makes up the atmosphere, continue to remain gravitationally bound to Earth up to the point that they begin to get stripped away by the solar wind. This occurs at altitudes of thousands of kilometers, not hundreds. And although very thin, the atmosphere is there, and all objects in low Earth orbit are affected by it. For example, the International Space Station, which orbits at an altitude of about 400 kilometers, is in a slowly decaying orbit and requires regular boosts to maintain its altitude. Perhaps the most famous example of orbital decay is Skylab. Skylab was the Americans' first orbital space station, launched in May of 1973 and last crewed in February of 1974. Its initial altitude was well over 400 kilometers, and the plan was to use the new space shuttle to boost its decaying orbit. 
However, deployment of the space shuttle became delayed, and in July 1979, Skylab re-entered and broke up over the Indian Ocean in Western Australia. Thankfully, in KSP, once something's in orbit, it stays in orbit. And that will end it for this tutorial. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope to see you again next time. Thank you